When I was a kid growing up, my grandma and grandpa had a house up on Manitow, Lake Manitow. I, I can still remember it in my head. I can see the A-frame that we used to go to, and there was a deck out front we would set on in the evenings. I can still remember we were on the first channel. I can remember the channel. I can take a tour in my head around the lake. I can, I can remember going skiing around the lake, and there's the honeymoon cottage out there on this little bitty island. And I remember the place where we used to fish at along the one side. It's kind of low, and we'd catch perch there. It's, it's, it's so easy in my mind to go to all those places because I, I remember them, and I think about them often. One of the things I, I think about often is um, um, tacos. Um, my, grandma, my grandma was not known for her um, ability to make Mexican food. That wasn't her strong suit. But one day she decided she was going to have tacos, and, and I don't know if it was either her tacos or me getting the flu at the wrong time, but I got so sick when we ate those tacos. I mean, like throwing up kind of sick. It, it was to that point where Every time I smelled tacos after that, it was like, Ugh. you know, have you ever had that feeling where you, it's like you can't hold it down because of the smell? It's just the smell that catch. It was so bad that when, uh, when I was in school, mom had to pack my lunch every time they had tacos at school. I just could not stand to put my mouth on those tacos. There's a term for that. It's called olfactory memory. Olfactory memory. It's memories that are connected to smells. Do you have a smell that triggers your memory? Do you smell a certain thing and all of a sudden you think about something, you remember something because of that smell? A, a number of years ago, my grandpa, my grandpa passed away about 40 years ago now, and uh, he used to smoke cigars. And we, we were walking through this, this place one day, and I smelled the cigar smell that was exactly what my grandpa used to smoke. I knew it. The second I, I go, oh my gosh, that's my grandpa's cigars. Do you have that kind of connection in your mind to things? Bacon and eggs. Bacon and eggs take me back to Grandma and Grandpa Gross's house. I'd go over there, and they were always cooking eggs and bacon for breakfast, and I'd eat with them. And pies at Grandma Spurlock's house. Oh, cherry pie and apple pie and peach. She put it in every Sunday. And we'd come home from church, and we'd smell the house. It's amazing how smells can take you back. It's not just smells, though. Gustatory is the word we use for stomach memories. <laughs> Things that we eat, you eat something that reminds you of something. Have you ever had something you put in your mouth and it reminds you of the past? It reminds you of some place that you went. Every time I put whipped cream pie in my mouth, I remember. I remember my childhood. Every time that I put ham loaf in my mouth, I remember funeral dinners at the Mexico Church of the Brethren. I, monkey bread reminds me of having break with the guys at work. And then there's ionic memories, memories that are connected to pictures. We love to go places where there's these great pictures of other places. You know, the kind you see on television, the kind that's in the front of magazines, books. You see that picture, and you're like, oh, I've been to Disneyland. I remember what that looks like, and it reminds you of the past. I love, I love the senses. To taste, to touch, to hear, to smell, to see. Senses are like awakened in me. The question is, do your senses draw you closer to God? Do your senses draw you closer to the Lord? Do you taste and see that the Lord is good? Do you hear and know that God is the Lord? Do you smell the glory of the risen Christ? Are your senses alive? Sensate is the term we're talking about today, loving God with our senses, loving God with our eyes, with our ears, with our mouth, with our nose, with our touch. If you're a sensate, these words from Gary Thomas will ring true to you. I feel closest to God when I'm in a church that allows my senses to come alive. I can see and smell and hear and almost taste God's majesty. I'd rather go to a museum than take a walk in the woods. I love classical music or good jazz. I enjoy attending a service that has incense and communion on a regular basis. I have a difficult time worshiping in a space that is plain or lacks any sense of awe. Beauty is important to me, and I will see and hear God's beauty in worship. What I just said comes from this book called Sacred Pathways by Gary Thomas. We're in a series talking about these nine sacred pathways to connect with God. Notice that little box. Nine ways to connect with God. And our intent through the sermon series is to help you connect to God. God wants a relationship with you. God wants to connect with you. But you've got some work to do in the process. God just doesn't connect with you because he wants to. He wants you to want to connect with him. 
And so the question is, how do you connect to the holy? Remember last week we talked about naturalists loving God in the outdoors? You see the majesty of his creation. You feel the presence when you're alone in the woods, and you connect them. You connect to God in those moments. And I, I believe that there's some people in this place, you love to go out into nature, and nature is that best place for you to know that God is good. I shared with you last week as a naturalist, you've got to do a little bit, though, to come into God's presence. It's just not guaranteed that you're going to take a walk in the woods and see God. You have to take a moment. You have to believe. Believe that God created everything. You've got to perceive the greatness of God, the vastness of God, the beauty of God when you're spending time in God's creation. And then you have to receive the instruction that God has for you as you're spending time walking in the woods or time looking into the pastures, time staring into the stars. You have to see what God has made and draw closer to him through his creation. The same thing is true with the sensate. The same thing is true with guys like me who want to taste and feel and smell. I got to believe. I got to believe that God gave me my senses. God gave me the ability to taste. God gave me the ability to see. God gave me the ability to feel. God gave me the ability to smell the bread and make me hungry. God did that. And I perceive the greatness, the vastness, the beauty. God, think about it for a minute. The things that God made, he gave us color. And smells, not everything smells the same. Not everything tastes the same. And in those moments, i got to perceive how great God is because my tongue tastes it, because my nose smells it, because my ears hear it. i got to experience God, and then i got to receive. What does God teach me as I'm tasting something sour? What does God teach me when I'm smelling something sweet? What does God teach me when I feel something rough? What does God teach me when I hear the notes in a song? If you're a sensei, you can draw close to God as you believe, perceive, and receive through your senses. Now, I talked to you last week about this idea of being a sensei uh, or about being a naturalist. And, and, and sensates are just a little bit different. They, they still like nature, but it's a little different. You want to see God through his beauty, if you're a sensate. You, you want to touch and feel the textures of creation, if you're a sensate. You want to hear the sounds that God has made, if you're a sensate. You want to smell the glory of God in the everyday. You want to taste and see that the Lord is good. The, the, the Bible is filled with stories of sensate. I, I want to just share one with you this morning. It's out of Isaiah chapter 6. As I'm reading this text, I want you to think, what is Isaiah hearing? What is he seeing? What is he smelling? What is he tasting? How many of Isaiah's senses are, are brought to the forefront in this passage? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on the throne, high and, and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraph, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their face. With two wings they covered their feet. With two wings they were flying. And they were calling out to one another. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Woe to me, I cried, I am ruined, for I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in its hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my lips and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. You, you talk about a moment of senses. The sight of God's throne the sight of the angels flying above it, the sight of the altar of God, the smell of the smoke that filled the room, the feel of the earthquake when the doorposts and the threshold shake, the sound of the angels crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the taste of the coal as it touched his lips. What was it like the next time Isaiah saw smoke? What was it like the next time Isaiah felt the ground shake? What was it like the next time Isaiah felt some heat on his lips? I 
the way God works through our senses. It reminds us. It reminds us of a time, a time that we grew close to him. Now, some of you are thinking, well, those are naturalist kind of things. Those are naturalists. I like the smell of the outdoors. I like the texture of the trees. I like the sound of the birds. I love the taste of the water running in the book. It's the same thing. but It's a little bit different, though. A naturalist has to go outside to experience the senses. A sensate like me, we want to stay inside. We don't like the bugs. Trees are great for making oxygen. It comes through my windows. We, we have a different view of the world. I, it's, it's the things that God allows other people to make that touch me. Art, music, food, drink, architecture. Th- those are the things that really draw me in the presence of the Lord. It was, it was 10 years ago that I got to go to this place. I, I wonder, does anybody recognize what this building is? Anybody recognize what this building is? I'll give you a little clue. It's in Rome. It's connected to the Vatican. It's where the cardinals go when they're going to elect a pope. This this is the Sistine Chapel. It's the outside of it, though. How often do we see the outside of the Sistine Chapel? It's usually the inside of the Sistine Chapel that we spend time with. It's, It's located in Vatican City. It's a chapel near where the pope resides. The chapel was reconstructed in 1473 and completed in 1481. A group of Renaissance painters were called to paint each relief on the walls of the chapel. Some of the great painters like Botticelli were commissioned for this task. Two frescoes were painted on each side of the altar. On one side of the altar is the life of Moses. On the other side of the altar is the life of Jesus. And a crucifix hangs between those two works. But most people don't go to the Sistine Chapel to look at the walls. It's the ceilings that most people are interested in. It was 1509 when Michelangelo began the backbreaking work of painting the ceilings of the Sistine Chapel. It would be 1512 before the work would be completed. Four solid years of laying on his back to complete the masterpiece. That wasn't enough. In 1536, Michelangelo was called for another piece of work on the chapel. It would be the back wall. It's called the final judgment. And it would be five more years for this to be complete. It would take 14 years of painting for the Sistine Chapel to be finished. Now, if you're a naturalist, you may say, that is so gaudy. If you're an ascetic, you may say, that was way too expensive. If you're a caregiver, you may say, look what the widows could have been fed with. If you're an activist, you may say, that was a waste of time. But if you're a sensate like me, you sense the presence of God in that place. In every one of those paintings, you see and you know and you feel how real he is. You, you know, We too often stand in judgment on the way some people connect with God. If people don't connect with God, just like I connect with God, we think that they may be wrong, that something's wrong with them. And maybe sensates get the worst of treatment of all. It's like our senses get a bad rap. It's like people believe that our senses are given to us from the devil. The devil can use your senses, but God gave you your senses. God wanted you to feel and to smell and to taste and to know that he was good through your senses. Everything could taste the same, but God said no. Everything could smell the same, but God said no. Everything could be the same color, but God said no. No, I'm going to give you textures and colors and sounds and smells. I want to give you variety. Cheesecake will not taste like steak, and apples will not taste like oranges, and pie won't smell like cake when it comes out of the oven. It will let you experience things differently. God is a God of variety. Do you know 
the loud and colorful God of scriptures that I know? God is loud, and God is colorful. I, I love the book of Revelation, the throne room of God, the gold lampstands, the beast, the red dragon, the heads, the horns, the water, the fire, the colors, the foundation of the temple, all of the different precious metals, all of the different stones, so much to see, so much to touch, so much to taste. There's a tree there. The tree of life is there, and you can pick its fruit, and you can eat from it. What will it taste like? What will it be like in our mouths? And you know how loud God is? God is a a loud God. Exodus chapter 20. God's going to give the people 10 commandments. And the people are told not to go up on the mountain of God, that God is going to come from heaven and be with them. Do you remember what happened in that moment? The Bible says that it started with thunder and lightning, and then a cloud covered the top of the mountain. And then smoke rose like a great furnace erupting over the mountain. And then fire came down from heaven, and then the mountain would shake, and they started hearing the sound of a horn. And it got louder and louder and louder, until all of a sudden the voice of God booms. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Can you imagine? Sin saints like me want to be there. I want to see it. I want to feel it. I want to smell it. I want to know. I want to know. And God, God is so colorful. A donkey talks. A fish eats a human and spits him out three days later. Trumpets sound and walls fall. Staffs are raised and water parts. Fiery furnace and men live. Mouths are shut with lions. Ravens bring a man food. A leper gets healed with dirty water. A woman gets leprosy because she calls someone unclean. Oh my gosh, God is colorful full of differences, full of change. God is is like no other. One of my favorite stories comes in John chapter 2, 1 through 11. If you're a sense that you're going to love this story as much as I do, Um, Jesus goes with his mom to a wedding, a wedding ceremony. And at the wedding ceremony that they go to, um, they, they have a little problem. They run out of wine. That's not a little problem if you're Jewish. That's a big problem. As a matter of fact, if you run out of wine, it's a sign that the family has been cursed and that the marriage won't last. So running out of wine was a really, really big deal. And and they run out of wine. And Mary comes to Jesus and says, hey, Jesus, we've run out of wine. And Jesus goes, not my time yet, Mom. And Mom's like, I don't care. You're my son. Do what I say. We've heard that from our moms, haven't we? And so Jesus says, hey, get those six stone water jars over there. And I want you to fill them full full of water. Six, and they each hold 30 gallons. So we've got 180 gallons of water in these six stone water jars. And then Jesus tells the guy who's the head servant, hey, dip some out of it, take it to the leader of the banquet, and have him taste it and see what he says. Now, I want you to think about the faith that it took for a man to dip water out of a stone water jar and carry it to a guy who's going to taste it to see if it tastes like wine or not. And the man puts it to his lips And he calls the master of the banquet. He says, hey, normally you give the best wine first and save the cheap stuff till the end. This is the best wine I've ever tasted in my life. If you're a guy like me, you're thinking, I want to taste. I want to know what God wine tastes like. I want to know how good it was. But, but, you know, if if you're a traditionalist, you're wondering if it's Walter's grape juice, aren't you? And if you're a caregiver, you're saying, sell it all and give the proceeds to the poor. And if you're an ascetic, you're saying, a little pack of Kool-Aid in each one of those would have been just fine. But if you're like me, let's taste and let's see how good God really is. You see, that would be the life verse of a sensate. Taste and see that God is good because he is. Taste touch, smell, see, hear. I love the senses. They are alive inside of me, and they should be in you too because God gave them to you. To taste cheesecake from the cheesecake factory, man, it's, 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 it's a moment. It, it can be a religious moment, and it can be just a moment. I, I love cheesecake from the Cheesecake Factory, my favorite place to eat in the entire world, and I can eat a piece of cheesecake, and it can just be cheesecake, or I can taste and go, oh, God, you are so good. I can't believe you gave somebody this kind of knowledge to make this kind of cheesecake. Oh. And then then once in a while, some of you all know that I like Cheesecake Factory, and so you get me these little cards that I can go down to the Cheesecake Factory. Thank you when you do that. I I appreciate it. I don't expect it, but thank you. When I take that little card and I I put it on the table for the lady to pay my cheesecake with that, oh my gosh, you know how good God is in that moment? It's like, 
I, I got to experience this piece of cheesecake, and it didn't cost me anything. Oh, God, how good are you? And the person who gave me the card, they're kind of like, they're caregivers, right? And they're like feeling good because they gave me a card. They felt like God's presence for giving me, and I'm like eating feeling God's presence. It can't get much better than that. God wants you to taste and smell, and see, and hear that he is good. God is good, my friends. He is so, so good. Peggy and I, um, we uh, went to the Louvre when we were on sabbatical a number of years ago. Um, this painting hangs on the wall at the Louvre. It's a giant, giant relief that's there. Um, this painting has the 12 disciples and how each one of the 12 disciples died. If you know the stories, um, you know that here in the top left-hand corner is Peter hanging upside down. He was crucified upside down because he didn't want to die like his Lord and Savior. If you go right below it is Andrew. Andrew died on an X-shaped cross. He didn't want to be hung on a cross like Jesus, and so they made an X-shaped cross for him to be crucified on. If you move right next to him, you see a man that's in a pot of boiling oil. That's John, um, the disciple whom Jesus loved. If you go straight below it, you see Bartholomew. Bartholomew probably had the worst death of all of the disciples. He was literally skinned of life. Death by a thousand cuts was the way he gave up his life. And every, everyone up here, everyone on this picture died for their beliefs, knowing that Jesus Christ lived, died, rose from the dead, and they would not change their confession of faith. I stood in front of this painting for, I don't know, it felt like an hour and tears running down my face, seeing what these people did, and then asking myself, what am I doing for Jesus? Would would, would I go through what any of those men went through if I was put in that place? Taste, see, smell, hear what do you what do you experience when you come close to the lord if you're a sensate you need to take a little bit of time and and use your eyes your ears your nose your mouth believe 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 that god gave you those senses perceive the goodness of god the vastness of god the power of god receive? What what does he want to teach you? What does he want to teach you as you taste something sour? What does it tell you? As you taste something that's bitter, what does it tell you? As you hear the sound of a symphony, what does it tell you? As you smell the bread baking in this church, what what does it tell you about him? Do you feel his presence? Do you know how real he is to me? Right now, right now, he's like everywhere to me and I smell and I taste and I know how good he is. This week, I just want to challenge you to, to use those senses and, and find him in them. Find him in them. Go, go to Culver's and get some ice cream with Andy's mints in it. Woo, baby. Or touch a piece of fabric. Feel it. Use your senses. And you've got to remember this week that if you're not careful, Satan will use your sight, your sound, your taste, your touch, your smell. He'll use it against you. He will. There's nothing you would like more than to take your senses and steal what it is that God has for you in them. And so we, we've got to be careful. We've got to be careful that we don't, we don't miss what God's doing for us. You know, you know there may be no greater, no greater moment for a sin state than when we come to a communion table. Partaking of communion is such an important part of my life. It's what I love to do. When I came here to this church 25 years ago, we took communion once every quarter. And I I got him to move it up to once every month because it's so important to me. And the Passover, the Passover was all about the senses. I mean, it was about seeing and touching and tasting and smelling and hearing. Everything that Passover was was a sensory moment of worship. I mean, they they would wash feet. 
Can you imagine when you walk into the door of a Passover, the first thing that happens is you take your sandals off and there's a servant there and they wash the dirt off of your feet as you begin to have this meal together. And then you gather around a table and you would sing songs and the, the table would be set with, with the best of china that you had in your house and there would be five glasses of wine at every person's table and you're going to taste the wine, you're going to eat the food that is there, olfactory memory, they're going to be connected to the smells, the same smell year after year after year, thinking about Passover, the gustatory memory, the gut memory, you would eat the foods that would remind you of what God has done for you, the iconic memory as you would look at the bread, as you look at the cup, as you see the empty space of Elijah, everything was heightened by your senses when they came to the Passover. And every sense at that Passover table was experienced by Jesus on the cross. Every one of them. Feel the wood of the cross that Jesus hung on. Hear the sounds of the scream as they would drive a nail through someone's hands and feet. Taste the sour wine, sight of a crucifixion, the smell of death. I want you to take just a minute. Take, take that nail and, and, and push it into your hand. Just, just feel, feel the point pressing into your flesh. How, how deep do you want to push? How, how, how quickly do you want to let off? And, and just think for a minute that they took a nail like that and they put it in the wrist of Jesus and they drove it right through the median nerve that's in there, the nerve that's connected to your fingers, and the fire that would have shot into Jesus' fingers when that nail was driven through his wrist, not just one, but two, and then through the bottom of his feet as well. And think about what it's like to feel his back as it rubs up and down on that rough wooden cross. Think about what it's like for Jesus as he tasted that sour wine, as he hung there for six hours, six hours of of sheer agony. He, he did that so you didn't have to feel the nail in your hand. So you didn't have to taste the sour wine. So you didn't have the smell of death. That's why he went to the cross, is to take those senses away from you. Aren't you grateful today that God didn't make you take that, that death? Aren't you thankful today that he took that death for you? See, every, every time you come to this communion table, it's it's a moment to taste and see that God is good. Every time we pick up a little piece of bread, and every time we put a little bit of juice in our mouth, we have a chance to experience, to experience what you didn't have to experience because of him. His body broken so yours wasn't. His blood shed, so you didn't have to. Him giving you life that you didn't deserve. Jesus reminds us. He reminds us at the Passover with these words. While they were eating, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And after taking the cup and giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant that is poured out for the many. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Jesus shed for you. Taste and see that God is good. Amen. Father God, thank you for these elements today that are here before us. And today, Lord God, you've called us to take a little piece of bread and to remember, to remember your death on the cross. And we've taken just a moment today, Lord God, to remember what that was like. The beating you took, the crown of thorns, the, the nails, the sliding up and down that rough wooden cross. Lord, we, we remember today your body broken. And Lord, today we remember your blood that was shed. From the blood that was shed there in Gethsemane as you prayed and sweat drops of blood to the blood that was shed on the whipping post to the blood that was shed when they put a crown of thorns on your head to the blood that was shed as they drove a nail in your wrist and in your feet from the blood that was shed as they took a spear and ran it into your side. Lord, you bled for us. And you did it so we could live under a covenant with your Father that would give us eternal life. 
You died so we could have eternal life, Lord God. And today we remember that at this table. We remember your body broken. We remember your bloodshed. And today we will taste and see how good you are, Jesus. You are so good. You are so good. And today we need a reminder of your goodness. So, Father, as we come to this table today, may the smell in this room, may the taste on our lips, may the feel in our hands, may the sight of the bread in the cup, may the sound of the music, Lord God, may all of that draw us into your presence in a new and a fresh way. God, we are so grateful that you, that you let us taste and know that you are good. May we taste and see how good you are. In Jesus' name.